So uh, this book that, that I want to talk to you about tonight is like a snapshot uh, of a journey. It's a snapshot of the journey that I've been on for decades. It's a snapshot of, of where I am at the moment on the journey. Now the journey isn't over. So in fact, eight years ago, I wrote another book called The Seer's Explanation, which was a snapshot back then. And I really didn't understand very much of the journey I was on. So the book kind of reflects that, but there's lots of information in there. And if you want more biography or more stories, there's stuff in there too. But you have to get that from Amazon. I don't have it. So I want to share this journey with you. And um, if it were a real physical journey out in the world, I could show you photographs of the places that I was. Maybe even pictures of me in those places. But this is an inner journey. So I can't show you any pictures of the inner journey. That just doesn't work. Um, the journey, if I had to, Actually, I did. If I had to put down one sentence about the journey, it's toward a greater sense of who all of us are than was available to me in its early stages. So my sense of self-awareness is that it continually expands. There's no end to it. As long as we're here on the planet, we have an opportunity to expand our awareness of who we are. And I promise you, your awareness of who you are is minuscule compared to who you really are. And maybe I can show you that or let you sense yeah. that tonight. So I'm going to describe my journey as best I can. And uh, my intention is that you, each of you, have an experience tonight. Now, obviously, you're having an experience. You're sitting there, you can feel the chair, you can feel the floor, you can see me, and all the other stuff in the room. But that's what the experience you're having right now, and the one I'm having right now, is prob probably a run-of-the-mill day-to-day experience. It's the sort of experience we have all the time. What I'm looking for is an expanding experience. And my intention is that you have one of those tonight. My intention is that I have one of those tonight. So I want to share the most important experiences that led to the book. And, you know, I can't really share an experience. So an experience happens right now. You're having an experience right now. And the experience that you're having right now will devolve into memory instantly. It'll no longer be present for you. If you're present, you'll be present to a new experience in the next moment, but the one that you had when I started this sentence, whatever that was, is gone. The experience is gone. But you have a memory of it, and you can have a story about it. So we saw a really nice sunset tonight. Somebody alerted us to the fact that there was a sunset, and we all went out the door and we looked at the sunset. I don't have the experience of looking at the sunset now. I have a memory of it. And I could tell you a story about it. I could describe the color, I could describe what it looked like, and I could even describe what it felt like. But I want to make that distinction right away. You all, the, your, your experience happens right now. And your experience is all that's truly real. The rest of it is, as I said, story. And it turns out to be very useful to make the distinction and to be aware of the distinction between your experience right now and your story about the experience. I, I, uh, I, I heard once uh, a metaphor for that, that when you go to the pancake house and you order up pancakes and you eat the pancake, that's the experience of eating the pancake. It's not the same as a description of eating the pancake, which is represented by the menu. If you eat the menu, you won't be satisfied. But we do that. That's what we do. We look in the rearview mirror pretty much all day long. We look at our memories of experience, and we think we're being present. Well, you're being present to the memory, but you're not being present to your experience. And that's where the power is. That's where the power to determine the quality of your life is, 
is right now. So try, I, I'd like to ask you to keep that distinction in mind as we go tonight. So along the way in this journey, things have become clear. We call them aha moments. And I want to tell you about uh, a few of those, maybe a handful of those. Now let me create a context for what I'm going to do tonight. So we have this famous Einstein quote. Whether he actually said it, I don't know, because I can't read German. But this quote is attributed to him. And he said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So the first implication is, the kind of thinking we use when we try to solve problems creates new problems. Well, that's interesting. So an exam a trivial example would be, you're in a relationship and you say something and the other person gets upset. And now you're upset because they got upset. So you want to fix it. So you say something else and it gets worse. That's a trivial example. A non-trivial example might be you have an economy that's humming along and a pandemic shows up. So factories cut back because people lose their jobs. So the people who lose their jobs are voters. So the politicians throw money at them. I realize I'm oversimplifying what happened. But you, the politicians throw money at them. Now you've got a whole bunch of demand, but, the, but the, the manufacturers have cut back on supply. So now you have inflation. That's what I mean. And I think that's what Albert meant when he talked about the kind of thinking that creates more problems when you try to solve the problems that are in front of you. So the question that I think flows from that quote is, what kind of thinking it is, is it? Can we zero in on what kind of thinking we use to solve problems that creates new problems? Now, occasionally, problems actually do get solved. They don't always, we don't always create new problems. But there is a kind of thinking I would suggest to you and I think we can define it. I think we can zero in on it and identify it that we all use to solve problems that create new problems. Now, Hoodwinked, the book, contains an answer to that question, what kind of thinking is it? But I need to share the journey with you so it makes sense when we get there. So let me hit the high points of the journey. So, in high school, there's a picture of high school. North Hollywood High School, Los Angeles, California. Interestingly, it says John F. Kennedy Memorial Hall. When I graduated, John F. Kennedy was president. Five months later, he was gone. So just to set the historical context. So in high school, I took a physics class. And I had no idea what I was interested in other than baseball and music because I heard music every day of my life. But in physics class, something happened. I felt something. So the physics blackboard looked kind of like that in high school. Pretty tangible. You know, this is stuff that there's springs there and there's a, there's a teeter-totter balancer thing and there's there's a, uh, a, a uh, there's a slope and a box, and how fast is the box going to go, and how and, and how much do things weigh, and how does that relate to mass? And these are fairly tangible things in the realm of human experience, things that we can see and touch. There isn't anything up there that you can smell or taste, but you get the idea. It's like stuff that's in the range or in the realm of human experience. So I began to notice in that class, I mean, I remember the guy's name, Mr. Corbin. So we're talking 1962 or 61 or something. It's pretty good to remember something that long. Um, the experience was, was visceral. I felt it. It's like, ooh, I can actually understand. I can actually understand something about how the world worked. And that turned me on. That was the first time I really felt passion. 
you know, I felt it. It wasn't just interest. It was like, I want, give me more. You know, I want to understand this stuff. So then I graduated high school and I went on to MIT. In high school, when I graduated high school, I was kind of a big fish in a small pond. I did really well. I was number two in a class of 400 and whatever. So I was kind of a big fish in the little pond. Here, not so much. And uh, I found myself, OK, I know why I'm here. I want more of that feeling of understanding. So I enrolled in quantum physics class. And now the blackboard looks like that. <laughs> and well, OK, I buckled down, and I learned as much as I can, and I did OK. I got as far as a master's degree, by the way. And I was in a PhD program. Um, but while we're still on this slide, the passion is kind of not there anymore mm -hmm. for me. It's like it had shown up and it had hooked me, but it wasn't there anymore. And I took class after class, maybe, I don't actually remember, maybe to try to get that feeling back, that experience back of, ooh, I understand. And there were a couple of those, as I recall, at MIT. But mostly it was about studying hard and not sleeping all the way. So somewhere along the line, that quickening that I felt, that passion, kind of disappeared. And at the time, I didn't have a career path. I didn't really know where I was going. Actually, I had no idea where I was going. In retrospect, it looks like had I stayed in this, on this path, I would have become a college professor. I didn't really enjoy the blackboard, puzzling over the blackboard. And I didn't really enjoy being in the lab and trying to get stuff to work. In fact, I, I had to do a thesis to get my bachelor's degree. And the, the experiment that I designed didn't work. So you kind of automatically got a B when it didn't work. You got an A if it did work. Mine didn't work, so I got a B. But it was enough to get uh, the bachelor's degree. And then I went off to the University of California, San Diego. And I realized at one point that I was running on inertia. You know, inertia is one of those uh, concepts in physics. We ordinarily think of inertia as, as huh, I can't even get off the couch. But actually, it refers to when something is moving, it tends to stay moving. And I felt the inertia of going to school and taking classes. But there was no, there was no passion in it. There was no goodies in it. You know, it didn't draw me forward. So I went outside into the quad, and the quad looked like that. Yeah. I got caught up in that. I felt purposeful, experienced a burst of energy, got involved with other people, and started publishing a newspaper, an underground newspaper in San Diego, Navy Town, great place for an underground newspaper <laughs> yeah. when you're protesting the war. And, uh, and it was very exciting. And um, somebody blew up my car who didn't like what we were doing. And somebody else shot a few bullet holes in the, in the front door of the office that we had downtown. So we moved everything in house. And after a while, it was like, what am I doing here? You know, it's like, I thought we could publish this newspaper and wake everybody up. And everybody would say, oh, yeah, we don't want this war. We don't want those people in, in office. Well. It kind of went on and on and on, and I got tired of feeling like I need a, <clears throat> an armed guard on the house, which is what we had. Mm -hmm. And so I sold what little I had, and I moved to Aspen, and I started playing music. And some of you know me from that then. Mm -hmm. In 1973, my, my dear friend Jan Garrett introduced me to this guy. He was 14 years old at the time from India, and I was invited to spend some time in his presence, wherever he happened to be. I remember going to Rome. Uh, my wife at the time had gone to India to be with him. Uh, I remember going to Kansas City. I mean, there were, you know, there were numerous trips. And in his presence, I felt something. 
I had an experience. It was, I, in the retrospect, I could describe it as giddy, uh, wanting to weep, sometimes both at once. It was a powerful experience of being in the presence of someone who, and I didn't have an answer, I didn't have the rest of that sentence. But I did realize there were a few, that there are a few people on earth who were in some way connected to something greater. I couldn't define that way. I didn't know what that way was, but I wanted it. If I can feel that way just by being around him, and that happens every time I see him, then there's something real there, and I want that. So that was experiential. It wasn't born of learning what he had to say. It wasn't born of, certainly wasn't born of learning Sanskrit or even how to sit and how to eat and all that. I tried being a vegetarian, that didn't work. I thought that would work, but it didn't. Um, actually, it didn't work for my body either. But uh, for some people, it does. But my point here is that I, I was again feeling something that was drawing me forward. And I was enthusiastic again. I was excited again. And remain so. He taught a meditation. I learned the meditation. I still practice it. So at 73, it's coming up on 50 years. And then in 1976, uh, I met this guy. And he gave a course called the S Train. And I took the S Train. And something happened to me in the S Train where I experienced seeing my mind my ego as something else it was like over there and i'd always thought that was my voice but all of a sudden it was riled up about what was going on in that room and i went oh that's over there that's another thing it's not me it said this thing you're doing is evil and i went no it's not and all of a sudden there were two of me you, you probably all know who Eckhart Tolle is. Eckhart Tolle explained the same thing in, in his first book, I think. He told the story of, of uh, coming to a point where he wasn't feeling really good about himself, and he said, I can't stand myself. And then he went, wait a minute. Sounds like there's two of me. The one that can't stand myself and the one that I can't stand. And that was like something that, it was a break. It was a break in the, in the continuity of his thought process. The experience that I had where my mind was something else, where it was separate, where it was over here, was a break in the continuity of my experience. Something changed. Something profound changed. And ever since, when my ego gets riled up about something, I know it's not me. I can feel it. It doesn't feel good. I feel anxious. I feel stressed or angry. And if I notice that, and if I don't, thanks very much, but no thanks, then I feel better. So there's value for me in making that distinction, and that has held up for, I don't know, 45 years, whatever it is. And the other thing about the ego, my ego, my mind, saying to me, this is evil. Now, what was it doing? I think it was trying to distract me and put itself back in charge. Because I was sitting in that room having an experience of, a, of an expanded sense of myself. And my ego didn't want that to happen. So it called the whole thing evil. trying to distract me from a, dis from a deeper sense of myself. Meanwhile, I've been reading books by this guy. Probably all of you have encountered this guy back in Aspen in oh, 70 or 71. It was almost like he was required reading. You know, we would walk down the street. And I don't remember what the bookstore was called that's across from the, from the bathrooms at the park. In downtown Aspen, anybody remember what that bookstore was called? I don't remember what it's called either, but I remember when one of these books 
went in the window, and I went in the door, reaching for Mike. I found myself really moved by the idea that there are people on the planet who aren't bound by the finality of the laws by which the world seems to operate. So there are stories in that book of an Indian sorcerer, a Yaki Indian sorcerer named Juan Matus. And there are stories about him performing feats that we ordinarily think are beyond the realm of possibility for human beings. And there was a movement, you know, 20 years later to debunk all of that. Maybe he didn't actually meet Don Juan. Maybe Don Juan didn't actually do all that thing, that stuff. You know what? It doesn't matter because when I read those books, I got inspired. I thought, okay, there are people on the planet who are not bound by the laws that we abstract from our daily human experience. And then I had one of those experiences of my own. I was, I bought that car, it's an International Scout, I think it was a 73. And I bought it in Southern California. And the criteria for the buying that car were it had to carry a whole bunch of music equipment and it had to have four-wheel drive. Those were the two criteria I had in mind. I, I wasn't really uh, uh, committed to having a good-looking car. And uh, the one thing I didn't consider at all was gas mileage. That thing got terrible gas mileage. And I was, as I was driving it, now, this is 1974. I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a credit card. I got money, paper money in my pocket. And this thing is gobbling gas like crazy. And I'm, okay, I went to MIT. I know how to figure this out on the fly, and I'm not gonna make it home. It scared the shit out of me. I mean, I was terrified. You know, it's, it's, I had never hitchhiked. I'd never been out. In the desert, I call it the desert, although, of course, it wasn't all desert between L.A. And, or between Berkeley, in this case, and, and Aspen. But um, I, I was freaked out. I was really afraid. And I had no religious training, but I'll tell you, I was praying my butt off in that car. <laughs> and I was doing it out loud. And I heard a voice. And the voice was deep, and it was resonant, and it was powerful, and it was authoritative. And it said, don't worry, Larry, we'll get you home. Seven words changed everything again. It's like, OK. Now I know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that there's consciousness around me. There's awareness around me that isn't confined to one of these. Because see, when we grow up in this culture, I don't know about other cultures, because I didn't grow up in it, but in this culture, we're taught, whether, it, whether it's explicit or not, that consciousness is somehow contained in one of these. This is a body with consciousness in it. You know, if you... Uh, if you go through the cosmology, starting with the Big Bang, and you go through how the universe was constructed according to this Big Bang theory, not the TV show, but the one they teach in <laughs> physics class, it's consciousness somehow arises as a function of evolution and as a function of complexity. So you put enough protons and neutrons and electrons and various configurations, and eventually, hopefully, on some planet, you get life. And then, at some point, you get awareness. And then, at some point, you get awareness of self, self-awareness. That's a story. But the story implies that consciousness is a function of the physical world, and that consciousness resides in one of these. And in that moment, wherever that was, in California, Nevada, wherever, wherever it was, it became clear to me that that's not the case. 
that there's awareness that isn't confined to this. Now, I can't prove that to you. I, and I can't show you a picture of whatever, wherever that voice came from, but it changed my life. That's what I mean by experience. It happened in the moment. And right now, I'm telling you a story about that experience in the hope that it will inspire an experience in you. Because that's, the rest of this is fun, maybe. Maybe you're bored, maybe you're having a good time. That's your experience right now. But the rest of this is kind of whatever it is. The only thing that's valuable is if you have an experience where you suddenly expand even though it's small. And possibilities might become apparent that aren't apparent to you when you, or weren't apparent to you when you walked in the door. And, what, and, and so I heard this voice. And now I'm driving along, and I'm no longer freaked out. I still don't have a cell phone. Still don't have a credit card. <clears throat> but... Somehow, I figure, okay, if they're going to get me home, whoever they are, maybe I can relax a little bit. And I did. I relaxed a little bit, and it's like, oh, look, the scenery. You know, I've been so preoccupied with my gas tank that I didn't see where I was. And now I'm having a good time. And 80 miles later, I look at the gas gauge. It hasn't moved. My first thought is, great. Now the gas gauge doesn't work. And, and then after a while, it did start to go down, and I said, okay. The, the, uh, the, uh, the physics student showed up again and said, okay, I know how to figure this out. It, it doesn't move until it gets this far down the road, and then it moves, and everything's okay. So I'm approaching, oh, I, this was in California, because I'm approaching the Sierra Nevada. And I don't want to go over there not knowing exactly how much gas I have, so I'm going to fill up. And I stop at a filling station, and I know how much gas the car should take, because I know how many miles I've gone. It took exactly the amount of gas that the gas gauge showed that it needed. I can't explain that, other than as a, as a powerful lesson from whomever from whoever, that the finality of the world, you know, this external thing that is the best we can do is to manage it, is to manage our experience of it and try to protect ourselves from it and try to find our way through it. The finality of that is a myth. It's a superstition. That's what I was left with. And so now... I need to create, I need to construct a new personal cosmology. I'm, I'm, I'm saying in the present where I was in 1974 in that car. I need to construct a new cosmology. It has to explain all the stuff that physics explains, but it also has to encompass what just happened. So the book that I'm presenting to you tonight is the current state of that journey to find a, an explanation of what's really going on. And in the years since, I've encountered other very, uh, uh, very useful people. People who uh, channel, they, that's their word, they channel higher consciousness. Uh, di uh, not disembodied, but unembodied consciousness or unembodied awareness. These three people have been really powerful influences for me in learning how to articulate this stuff. And I think these people want to assist us in discovering who we really are. And if you listen to them, not to judge what they say, but to see if something happens in here, it can be very useful. So my question is, all right, so what's really going on here? Given those experiences that I told you about, which deviated the course of my life and which led to my being up here and led to you being where you are out there listening to me and that book and all that, what's going on here? What's really happening? So 
my hero, and, and uh, very often a physics student will have Albert again as his hero, um, I, I imagine a conversation between Albert Einstein and Juan Matus, the fellow that Carlos Castaneda wrote about, this Yaki Indian sorcerer. And so he's represented by the raven, and the raven says, hey Albert, which comes first, consciousness or the physical world? And Albert says, that's a good question. Well, if we look at quantum mechanics, this slide uh, I put in here uh, to represent questioning the <coughs> assumption that the physical world comes first, that it's permanent and we're transients. If you think about a human life, it has a beginning and an ending. There's a point before that human life appears on the planet in the world, and there's a point after which that human life is no longer there. It sure looks like human beings are transient, and this is what's permanent. Isn't that obvious? Isn't that common sense? And in physics, you can do a reductionist approach. You can say, well, what's this made of? And you can define the material that this is made of. And then, well, what's that material made of? So, so this isn't wood, it looks like wood, but pretend it's wood, okay? What's the table made of? It's made of wood. What's the wood made of? Cellulose, largely. Well, what's cellulose? And I could have, but I didn't, put up a, a, a molecular map of cellulose, and it has atoms in it. Well, what are the atoms made of? Well, you can keep going. That's the reductionist approach. Where is the consciousness coming? In other words, you can take this wooden table, which is the wood, I know, but I'm pretending. You can take this wooden table and you can get all the way down, all the way down to quartz. But where did the consciousness come in? It's, it, if you really think about it, I don't think it makes any sense at all. When you do that, when you do the reductionist approach and you get down to fundamental particles, like electrons and neutrons and protons, and I pro promise you there's no quiz at the end of this, so don't let that upset you. You have to use quantum mechanics. You have to use quantum theory. Quantum theory is one of the two most powerful theories we have to explain our observations of the physical universe. The other one is general, uh, general relativity. I'm not going there, don't worry. What is quantum theory? Aside from what it looked like on the blackboard before? Well, it's a story. It's a story about the relationship between the world and the observer. If you study quantum mechanics, you, you, you are taught the equations by which the way it looks now, well, this is the way it's gonna look in the future. And it's, and it's done that, it's done what just happened. Thank you. Um, quantum mechanics is about if you observe the way a physical system is right now, this is the likelihood that it will look a certain way in five minutes, or five milliseconds, or 50 years, or whatever. It's, the, it's a story about the way it's gonna look. It's not the way it is, it's the way it's gonna look. And if you think about that, you see that, that the most powerful theory we have to, to describe what things are made of is about observation. It's not about the world. Well, what does that say? What does that say about what a human being is? See, quantum theory doesn't actually say anything about the world itself. It only speaks to what you're likely to see when you observe it. It's an enormously powerful thing to realize, but you don't hear about that. If you read about the lives of quantum physicists, Bohm and Feynman and Bohr and Schrodinger and all those people, you don't hear a whole lot about what it means about what it is to be a human being. Bohm gets a little closer. 
So this is, a, this is what I might call the subtle part of the talk. What does it say about us? This story about the relationship between the world and the observer denies the existence of a durable, physically real world independent of his observation. The best theory we have is about observation. It's not about the world. Let that sink in. So where is this going? Where does letting that sink in go in? See, I gradually awaken to the realization that the world isn't what it looks like. It looks like a durable, physical, external entity that will outlast us. That's what it looks like. But I've come to feel that what the world actually is, it, whatever the world actually is, it behaves as if it reflects back our expectations of it and the story we tell about ourselves. That's where this journey has led me. The world behaves as if it reflects back to me the story I tell about myself, about you, and about the world. If I tell a story about you, like, she's hard to get along with, or he's just not, you're likely to show up that way. I found that if you take the time and the effort to change that story. Like, take somebody in your life, do, do this little experiment. You don't have to talk about it, you don't have to tell us who it is. Do this little experiment. Take somebody in your life who's hard to, hard to love. I bet you all have one. I bet you can all come up with somebody who's really hard to love. And see in the next don't do it right now necessarily unless you want to, unless it comes up for you, but in the next few days, think, see if you can tell a different story about that person. See if you can identify the parts of them you do love. Or the way they did this and it really was great for you. And then see if they start to show up differently. That's been my experience. And I'll do a little reading in a bit that will illustrate that for you. Okay, but back to the question. Why are our problems so hard to fix without creating new ones? Because that's where we started. So let me tell you what I think is going on. You have the fish. He's swimming in a container called the ocean. He's never been outside of that ocean. So consequently, everything he's ever looked at has been through that ocean, through the water. Now, the ocean consists of water, largely of water. And I say largely because there's stuff dissolved in the water. Sand, silt, organic matter, whatever it turns out to be. And those impurities, let's say, those impurities distort or otherwise interfere with his view of whatever he's looking at. He doesn't know about the impurities. He doesn't even know about the water. He's just looking at whatever he's looking at, but the stuff that's dissolved in the water affects or distorts whatever he's looking at. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we live in an ocean too. That's us, those eyes. That represents us. We live in an ocean too, and we've never been outside of that ocean. Everything we've ever looked at has been through that water. See, our ocean consists of our beliefs. It consists of everything we know about ourselves, about each other, and about the world. Everything we know is represented by that ocean, and we look at everything through that water. So let's take that as a premise. So far, so good. Although the water itself can affect how things look. You may have uh, had the experience of lying in the bathtub and looking at your feet. And you think they're further away than they actually are. Or is it closer? I can never remember. But the water itself changes the way your feet look. Everybody had that experience? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. But there's an additional problem for us human beings. Because our belief systems contain impurities as well. Our ocean of understanding has impurities dissolved in it. And those impurities act to distort or otherwise interfere with our view of whatever we're looking at. 
But we don't know about those impurities. So we think whatever we're looking at is the way it looks. But it's being distorted by impurities in our ocean of belief. What are those impurities? Well, misunderstandings, mistaken ideas, things we were told by people who didn't know any better. Um, now, uh, most of us turn on the news now. We do it with the radio, or we read a newspaper, or we turn on the TV. And I don't know about you, but mostly what I see is suffering. Struggle and suffering and mayhem. And if you watch PBS, at the end, they usually have a couple of feel-good stories, which I think they try real hard to put on the screen. But mostly what you see is horrendous. I think if you consider the scope of the suffering in the world, the word misunderstanding is inadequate. I think a better choice would be superstition. I think we're a superstitious bunch. I think those of us who try to fix the problems in the world are looking at those problems through an ocean of superstition. I think that's why we don't get to fix those problems. As long as we're immersed in that ocean of superstition without realizing it, we will continue to act out this human drama over and over and over again. Here's how Shakespeare put that. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That, to me, is the feeling that you get when you look at the world. That's the feeling I get when I look at the world. It's like over and over and over again. What's the way out? Well, the way out, I think, is not problem solving the way we're used to doing problem solving. Because when you solve problems, you tend to create new ones. The uh, very type, I didn't already use the, uh, the example of economics, which is one of the things you hear about and see on the news. So you have an economy that's humming along pretty well. I did talk about this, didn't I? And you have this pandemic. Okay. We're not getting the problem solved. We're spending a lot of money, and we're getting each other all riled up but it doesn't look to me like we're solving problems. The way out of this mess is not through problem solving, period. It's through waking up. You have to wake up to a larger sense of who you are. It's as if problem solving is represented by the highway system and you're, when you're, where you're trying to go is across the ocean. You can't get there with that, with that technology. So here's one guy that I came across this and it said it for me, it said, it expressed the way I feel. His name is Omri Bertson. And he said, fortunately, some are born with spiritual immune systems that sooner or later give rejection to the illusory worldview grafted upon them from birth through social conditioning. They begin sensing that something is amiss and start looking for answers. Inner knowledge and anomalous outer experiences show them a side of reality others are oblivious to. And so begins their journey of awakening. Each step of the journey is made by following the heart instead of following the crowd and by choosing knowledge over the veils of ignorance. He's a French philosopher. He lived from 1859 to 1941. You have to wake up. And the alarm clocks that wake you up are present in your life now. By the way, when I use the word you, I'm talking to all the human beings in the room, including this one. So I'm not putting myself apart from y'all. This is the human condition. 
We've all been hoodwinked. We've all been hoodwinked into believing a whole bunch of stuff that isn't real. That's superstition. Believing a whole bunch of stuff that isn't real is superstition. The veils of ignorance he talks about. Knowledge, like power, can't be gained from other people. It has to be claimed by ourselves. Knowledge has to be gained, has to be claimed by yourself. You have to draw on your experience and say, uh-huh, I get it. I hear it. You know, another metaphor is the world is very loud and the universe is very soft. You are the universe. I am the universe. But in order to hear myself with a capital S, in order to hear that collective that spoke to me in the car that day and said, don't get me home, they, they spoke in the, in the plural. And those three uh, channelers that I showed you also speak in the plural. We said, they said. We've all been hoodwinked into accepting as real the illusory worldview grafted upon us by social conditioning, that everything is a trail, or a zero-sum game, that physical decline is inevitable, that you have to go out and find love, that you have to make things happen, that you have to fix problems, that you have to fix the world. The world isn't broken doesn't need to be fixed. It's a perfect reflection of who we think we are. If you look at the news from there, I think it starts to make sense. We're superstitious. We believe in a whole bunch of stuff that isn't real. That's why the world looks the way it looks, because it's reflecting us. Imagine yourself inside a bubble. What you see on the, in, on the inside walls of that bubble is you. It's reflective surface. That's the world. The world is the inside of a bubble. I realize you have to add a dimension or two to get that to work. But if you feel that, it can make a huge difference in your life. It has for me. Because we bring the world of our experience into, belief, into being by perceiving, by interpreting sensory input, nothing is inevitable. And there are no trade-offs. When you, when you experience something, when you use the word, I'm experiencing something, usually we do it in the context of interpreting sensory data. We went outside that door and we looked at the sunset. You know, my, my, the, the light from the sunset hits the rods and cones and there are electrical impulses and my brain makes a picture of the sunset. And I think it's out there. It's not. The picture's in here. My brain's making a picture of sensory input. As far as we human beings know, that's all there is. There isn't any out there as a place except as a way to visualize, as, except it's a projection as a way to visualize and experience whatever the topic of the conversation is. Yeah, it's real in the sense that you can go out there and kick something and stub your toe and it hurts, but it's not real in the same sense as your experience and who you actually are, because it's a projection like a hole in that. What's real is your experience. So what's your experience right now? Ask yourself. Are you bored? Are you waiting for this to be over? Are you inspired? Are you looking forward to thinking about this? Are you looking forward to reading your book? Do you not care? <coughs> Do you feel the chair under your butt and behind your back? Do you feel the floor under your feet? Do you feel the temperature in the air? That's real in the moment, right now, experience. The problem you're having with your brother, that's not real. It's a memory. 
It's not experience. It's not happening right now. I'm, I hope I'm getting to make this distinction for you because it's crucial. If you be in the right now experience and leave the past to memory, you can rummage through it now and then if you need to remember a phone number or something like that, or what happened the last time you opened the door too fast or something like that. But if you can stay in the now and stay out of the future, which is again a picture in right that you have right now of what you think might happen, and stay in the right now, you'll begin to feel your belonging. You'll get to feel your that you're a part of like a fractal. Not like you're not all of it, like you're just a little part, but you're part of it all. You are it all. You are the universe. Looking at the universe from a particular place, or looking at the world from a particular place. Okay, I told you I'd do a little reading. I'm going to make this as quick as I can. But I want to illustrate the idea of changing your story. And I want to uh, illustrate that with uh, me and my mom. Probably something that everybody can relate to. So this is a reading from Hoodwinked. I venture to say that everyone who knew me and my parents when I was growing up saw a loving, fully functional family unit. That was my experience much of the time. Underneath the surface, however, there, there were dynamics at play that would have required a dispassionate and careful viewing to perceive. I didn't have that perspective back then. Back then. I didn't know why I felt what I felt. But recognition of these dynamics in my later life have served me as a way to illuminate the idea of a, of a reflexive world of experience, the world reflecting back to me my story. My mother was certainly the dominant figure in much of my life. She and I were on the planet together for about 62 years. Memories and photos I have from our early years show us to have been especially close. My father died around the time of my high school graduation, so my relationship with my mother became the dominant influence in my life. Maybe you can relate to that, maybe with a mother or a father or somebody else. During my academic years, my mother was fully supportive of my path in life. I never thought much about that support. I just assumed it was a natural part of my emotional landscape. When I left school for street politics and later for playing music in Aspen, I felt her approval steadily diminish. I didn't feel her approval. Well, my, my feeling of her approval steadily diminished. I fought hard to get it back. I really tried. I wanted it back. I wanted her approval back. I kept her apprised in my efforts to make my own way, and I consistently attempted to regain that approval by explaining why I made the choices I did. But in 1970, playing rock and folk and country music in Aspen, Colorado, I had seemingly left behind an important and certainly not inexpensive education and career path. I expended enormous quantities of energy trying to justify myself to mom. I didn't realize at the time what was really going on. I was not aware that I was engaged in a power struggle that largely defined my being in the world. It consumed me. Throughout my childhood, I believed that personal power was out there, principally in the hands of my parents. Much later, I came to see that for many decades, the defining theme of my life was to try to get that power back. I made choices that made me happy, and then I tried, mostly unsuccessfully, to get my mother to agree that they were the right choices. I really tried. I also came to understand that what I had previously seen as a struggle to be right in a disagreement with somebody out there was better understood as a conflict within myself. It took me decades to see that. Over many decades, I had internalized my mother's view of a son's proper behavior, and that view conflicted with the choices I was making. Not understanding that point, I projected the conflict outwards into my relationship with her. From that perspective, my mother never accepted me for who I am. That's my story. 
That story has elements that many readers might find to be similar to their own story. She just doesn't understand me. My life would be so much better if she did. You might have to make a G for you to relate to it. That's the story I invented. I fed it from year to year, and for me, that story was the relationship. But after her passing, something different happened that relates directly to the new life story, the new explanation I've been trying to explain in this book. In the course of many, many hours of reflection on that relationship, I've come to realize that the story I told all those years about my relationship with my mother not only served to justify my actions and feelings, but also served to perpetuate the difficulty of the relationship, the power structure, the power struggle I couldn't win and didn't even manage to identify it as such. Let me do that again. The story I told all those years not only served to justify my actions and feelings, but also served to perpetuate the difficulty of the relationship. As time went by after my mother passed, I sought a better answer, a more satisfying and empowering way to think about our relationship. I was reminded of an idea I took from Don Juan. He spoke about the petty tyrant. According to Castaneda, Matus said that the world itself is the tyrant because it's reflection back to us of the description into which we live our lives is inexorable and unyielding. It always tells the truth. It always reflects back the story we tell. It's inexorable, and it's unyielding. From that point of view, there seems to be no getting around the fact that whatever story we tell gets reflected back to us, and the conditions of our lives will not change until we tell a different story. That's why you can't fix problems with action. That's why the problems of the world act like, what, what is that, whack-a-mole? You whack it down over here, and it pops up over there. You whack down the the lack of demand, and now you got inflation. We'll see what they do about inflation, but I promise you it'll create some other problem. So I decided to say to people that she had actually made a significant difference, a significant contribution to my search for understanding of what a human being really is, the inquiry that's the subject of this book. Without any hope of feeling the satisfaction I thought I would gain from convincing her that I was on the right path, I had no choice but to go deeper into the understanding of who I really am so that I could then feel real certainty. Therefore, I made her my petty tyrant, my life coach after the fact. And I, I don't know if what I showed you about quantum physics is in any way a nudge towards expanding your view of what a human being actually is. But the most powerful theory we have of the universe is about observation. It's not about the world. If you can internalize that the way I have worked to internalize it, I see that the human being, a human being, is a creator. We create the world that we experience by interpreting sensory data. It's like a television set decoding the information that's in the cable. You know, the information that's in the cable. It decodes it. And there's this story about the child that, that whose father is a, is a uh, TV personality. So the kid sits in front of the TV and there's daddy. So he goes around the back of the TV to find daddy. It looks like daddy's there. It looks like the world is actually out there. I promise you it's not. It's in here. We're all in here. You're in here with me, and I'm in here with you. That's all there is. Out there is a projection so that we can dance and play together and work out issues. Somebody once said, we don't have problems anymore. We have issues. <laughs> so I, I, I'm... I so appreciate you being here tonight, because I don't get to do this without you. And I feel an expanded self, my sense of myself standing up here, watching your faces, and taking in your
friendship. And I can't even express to you how much I value your friendship and the fact that you're here, even though some of you are fighting to stay away. And that happens to me too, even when I'm engaged in something that's interesting to me. So um, we have copies of Hoodwinked over there, and they're $15, and we have lots of $5 bills. And we can accept Venmo and PayPal and credit cards if I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I can get the technology to work and all that. Um, five minutes of questions. <coughs> and if you have a question, have it, raise it in the service of all of us, not just, you know, it's your own issue. Have it. You can tell a story like I did with my mom, but have it be in service to all of us. Anybody? I know I went through a lot. Yes, Mark. Um, I'm wondering today, all these years later, how do you interpret or try to drill down on what that voice and who or what that voice was in California that you heard out in the middle of nowhere? Mark, my... My sense is that I chose to come to planet Earth and grow a body for the purpose of experiencing, of having human experience. And before I did that, and I'm kind of loosely using time when I say before, before I did that, I knew who I was. I knew I was a part of everything. And then I forgot. I got acculturated. I learned how to run this thing. And I learned how to run Larry, which is a very complicated beast, just like the one you have. And I asked for connection. And I experienced connection from within a human personality that really only understood communication in terms of language. So I took a, an experience of it's okay, and I turned it into seven words of English. So I don't for a moment think that they spoke in English. But my connection with those out there who are not embodied, and I do say it in the plural, even though I think of it as one, I'm a human being, and when I look out in the room, I see y'all. I see m multiplicity. There's, what, 20 people here? I see 20 different people. But I also know in my heart that we're all one. How do you resolve that? I don't know that you do in one of these. may take moving beyond one of these. But I think that when you hear all that is speak to you, you have no choice but to turn it into a language that you understand. But you could also say, Mark, and this is a really good point, you could also say that the words you're listening to right now are just a way to focus your attention, and the communication is taking place underneath that. Heart to heart, soul to soul. And once again, we project this so that we can grapple with it, so that we can play with it experience it. But I think that if you examine spatial separation, you'll see that it's a contrivance. I mean, we even talk of, 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 uh, of spatial separation in terms of time. Time is more fundamental. We talk about something being light years away. Well, that's defining space in terms of time. I really do think that space is artificial, Separ which implies that separation is artificial. I'm getting away from the question. Is there another? Yes, Beth. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you were just answering that, you were framing it that um, before you came into this physical being, that you had kind of a greater uh, awareness, I don't know how you articulated it, but coming in here required a little bit of a distillation or maybe or forgetting that's how you I said. use the word for God yeah for God and um, and 
and, and that's resonant with, with me. And, and I guess the, for me, it kind of brings up that qu question of, um, I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit about this, is then why do, you know, why do we come into this contracted um, physical being? Um, and is it to remember? I mean, it's a curiosity, right? It's a reductionist thing. You're coming from here, you get funneled into this thing with the invitation to expand again, potentially into a knowing that you, you had before you did. It, it's, it's a wild trip, and for me, it kind of begs a... Let me see if I can show you why we come here. Yeah. Okay, come here. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs> this is why we come here. Oh, we to dance. dance. Mm -hmm. To dance and to experience. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Dancing is very fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what we do, all of us, with one another. And with our computers and with the room and with all that is, we're dancing. Right. But we smear a layer over the top of that called ego. Mm -hmm. And now we have problems. Mm -hmm. There was no problem doing what we just did. Right, right. But if I got in my head about, well, how does it look to the dance instructor mm -hmm. back there? Now it's not so fun. Right. There is no dance yeah. <laughs> Charles is there, and that's close. <laughs> well, Connie, I want to hear from you. Well, a lot of this, I feel, is above my <laughs> intellect at this point. But it brings up a question that I've had on and off my entire life is, why can I only see the people I see, the people that are around me? Why can't I see something that's going on in Glenwood right now with the people that are in Glenwood? There's a metaphor for that. Um, have you ever used a camera where you could adjust the depth of field? Mm -hmm. So you're looking through the camera and you're turning something. I don't really know how this works, but I've seen it. Where there's a something in the foreground and the background is diffuse and you turn this thing and the foreground goes diffuse and all of a sudden you're seeing in the background. So it has to do with focus. It's a rather loose metaphor, but it has to do with focus. You're focused on your here now and this is what's here now. Glenwood is a story. Mm -hmm. You can't experience Glenwood. I've, I've told this, I've said this before, Here's another little mind game for you. A human being cannot experience there. Okay? I'm here. I'm experiencing here. Well, I can go over there and experience there. So I go over here, now I'm here. I can't experience there. There is a concept. It's not real. Here is real. I can experience here. So. The folks that are in Glenwood that you can't see, that's a story. Yes, you have a reasonable expectation of being able to get in your car and going down there and actually seeing those people, but for right now, it's not real. It's a story. Does that help? A little bit, but why am I having my stories, and I know Janice, and I know her stories, <clears throat> but I'm not seeing the same thing that she's seeing in her life. That's why all of us are here. Mm -hmm. All of us are here to form a composite view of the world. And apparently it takes about seven and a half billion of those individual views to create a composite of what we're dealing with. And all of those souls, in my, in my story, in the story I tell, all of those unembodied souls chose to come here to participate in this drama, this play, where we get to work this stuff out. And um, we really have made a lot of progress in the last <coughs> few thousand years, even though it's such a mess right now. And partly, it's a mess right now because of our expectations. 
you know, I expected things to be better by now. I'm just telling you my <coughs> truth. When, when Barack Obama was elected, I thought things would be better by now than they are. And I, I, I think I can explain why they're not, and I think that's what I endeavored, and, and I know that's what I endeavored to do with the slides I showed you and what I talked about. But it appears that it takes about seven and a half billion of us <coughs> to fully implement this play, this Shakespearean thing <coughs> that we're witnessing. And, and, and the futility of it, the futility of the whack-a-mole attempt to make the world better. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Marjorie? How long have you been working on this book? Since, well, this book since the last one, which is eight years, but uh, the idea since 73 actively working on it since 73. Did you, did you find any um, um, uh, impetus to get to where you could write it from COVID? Well, it was the seclusion That's what that I was part that. of being in that frame of reference that allowed us to get this thing done, yes. Yeah. I, I had a similar thing. Just the isolation really helped. Yeah, yeah. And, and that feels purposeful to me. It yes, doesn't it feel is. like an accident. And it's funny because it, it really wasn't relating to other people, it was all me and it was a very useful time. Yeah. It was an opportunity for Kay and me to do this project together and to discover the enormous strength of our relationship. Because when she says, I've read this sentence three times, I don't understand it, you need to rewrite it. And my ego goes, I think it's a perfect sentence. <laughs> We got through that with flying colors. So it was a multifaceted win, what we did in those months that we spent in the office in front of the computer. Silver lining playbook. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I remember being fascinated uh, when I read that a, a, a child, a, a baby, doesn't recognize a separation between itself and the mother until about two years of age. And it appears that we, we become aware at that point in a different way. And partly what I, what I think you're talking about is how do we reintegrate into that unawareness of being connected? I think that when we come forth as infants, we are confronted by a barrage of color and light and movement, and we have no idea what's going on. And we have to learn to distinguish objects. We have to learn to isolate objects from the background. And at some point, it becomes clear to the infant that there's an other out there upon whom she or he is fully dependent, and that generates the parent-child relationship. Before that, it's all one thing. It's all one undifferentiated thing. We have to learn to recognize the world. We have to learn, to, and, and, and the way I like to say it is we have to learn to create the world out of an undifferentiated mass of <coughs> sensory input. That includes sights and sounds and tastes and smell. <coughs> yes, Kathy? It sounds like that detachment would be a useful tool. Yeah. Det detachment, when we meditate, we release thoughts. 
and focus on breathing. When we detach, we can also separate from your emotions. Or, and it, it, it can sound like it's not compassionate, but, but it also can be useful. What sounds like it's not compassionate? Being detached. Being detached. So having having detachment, but it, I see. But I, I'm just curious if you, without saying that word tonight, if that is some of what you're saying that you detached from your ego, <coughs> um, and you separated that. And the way I put it is the way I have put it is. I was able at some point to begin to distinguish my ego, my personality, my invented self from who I am. Before that moment or before that process played itself out, I didn't make that distinction. It was all one thing. I thought it was me that was calling, I would have thought it was me that was calling that training I was sitting in evil. I say it's evil. But in that moment, it was like, who said that? That wasn't me. I'm not going to ball in here. What do you mean? You know, and all of a sudden, there was that distinction. <coughs> Making distinctions is part of waking up. You begin to make distinctions that you didn't make before. Like the distinction between experience and memory. Uh, Werner Erhard, whose picture I showed you earlier, used to talk about what human beings do is we drive our cars around by looking at, at and holding on to the rearview mirror. And he was talking about the past. He was talking about memories that we're sorting through and sifting through to try to find an answer for what we're dealing with right now. And he said, when you drive your car like that, you have a lot of accidents. Steering wheel's over here. Your rear view mirror is up there. You're looking in the mirror and you're twisting it and then you hit something. It's a good metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. You gotta be here in your experience. And making distinctions like that is a powerful thing. Making a distinction like here and there are not on equal footing. Here is real, there is an idea. They're different. So detaching would be okay if it was in here, that you're making that distinction, knowing that you're <coughs> detached or whatever. Anyway. Well, yeah, and right detachment, you could say, you could say, detaching myself from having my hands in the clay uh, allows me to remember that I am the one who has his hands in the clay. Another metaphor might be, it's an old story. The, the, uh, the boy is walking through the woods, the forest, and he comes upon a pond, and it's absolutely still. And he leans over the pond to look at it, and he sees himself. And there's, you know, as a reflection in the surface of the pond, and it's absolutely still, and it's a perfect image of himself. And he wants to smooth his hair out. So he reaches into the pond, and now it's all like this, and he can't see himself at all. So detachment is also about let go of it. It'll be all right. There's nothing wrong with it. No need to fix it. Let's just, let's just come back in here. Meditation is a powerful tool for that, whether you sit and meditate or you walk in the woods or you drive but you allow yourself to be right here while you're driving, as opposed to thinking about what you need to do when you get over that hill, being right here. So detachment is a way of bringing your energy and your awareness back inside yourself, being aware of yourself, not your personality, not your ego, but yourself, the one that's actually breathing. And it, it actually allows the rest of it to settle down somewhat, so you can deal with it more effectively. Anybody else? <coughs> kind of <coughs> triggers. Let's the, have this be the last one because I'm running out of <coughs> voice. <coughs> triggers a little, another little thought to my question that was going to ask. But earlier you were talking about, you know, the world has lots of issues going on, lots of problems. We're, things of that nature, things that we perceive as maybe not being good that we want to fix. But at, 
the same time or in the next couple of sentences you say, you know, we can detach ourselves, use the word detach ourselves from those issues and not worry about needing or wanting to try to fix, you know, issues in the world. You know, what do we what do we do with that if we all decide not to do anything, you know, about issues that we perceive in the world that might need attention. What do we do with that? Do we, you know, remove ourselves? I mean, you know, yeah, we just focus more on ourselves. You know, that what you change do? the outer situations that still exist. Yeah, you can't change the outer situations that exist because they're a composite reflection of the souls that are on the planet right now. And they're having the experience they came here to have, as are you. What you can do is be in the experience of yourself, which is love and joy. And I promise you, if you're not feeling love and joy, you're not fully in the experience of yourself. So that's the other way to look at it. If you do that, it radiates out. Now, radiates out, radiating out into what? Well. Can you see the gravitational field? No, but it sure keeps you in that chair. Well, you can't see the quantum field or the, or the beingness field in, 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 on the planet, but it affects you. And it sustains vibration just like every other field. So if you be in joy, it radiates out. That's the most powerful thing you can do to heal the world. Not to fix it, but to heal it. To heal the souls who are, here, who are here, let them feel your love. That's all you need to do. That's all you can do, but it's also all you need to do. Thanks, everybody. I am so glad.